Thank you. Resuming debate, the Honorable Member from Halifax. Here, here. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm very proud to be here in this House on the 40th Parliament as a new member representing Halifax. And may I start with a heartfelt, heartfelt thank you to the people of Halifax who have placed their trust in me as their Member of Parliament. I also wish to recognize and thank Alexa McDonough, who represented my riding at both the federal and provincial levels for more than 30 effective and passionate years. Here, here. I have to say, as I'm making my inaugural speech, that I feel a very heavy responsibility as I struggle with the need to find the words which will focus the attention of this House on the urgent situations facing the communities that I represent. We're a riding with a highly mixed urban community as well as fishing villages. We have very diverse and multicultural backgrounds. My constituency is made up of people who are coping with the everyday difficulties of life, and it has struck me that the pomp and pageantry of this magnificent house seems very far removed from the realities of everyday life in Halifax. With the highest density of students of any city in Canada, Halifax has residents struggling with monumental student debt and uncertain futures. We have the legacy of Africville, with members of the African Nova Scotian community still contributing their vibrant and active sense of culture throughout our city, despite their unanswered calls for recognition and reparations. We have thousands of seniors who are finding it more and more difficult to do simple things like paying their heating bills. We have Mi'kmaq people, still looking for concrete commitments to improve their lives after the ray of hope, which was the residential school apology. We have the communities of Spryfield, Fairview, Harriotsville, and Ketch Harbor. Each are unique and each have a strong sense of community. We also have a strong military presence in our city with many families who have loved ones on the base, overseas, in Afghanistan, or at sea. Our military families live with the terrible uncertainty of the war in Afghanistan has brought about and the lack of support which seems to await our veterans after their military service has ended. Over the past number of years, I've worked with individuals who heat with their ovens or heat only one room of their home at a time because they can't afford fuel. Their choice is between heating their home or feeding their kids. They choose between heat or eat. They know they should insulate and upgrade, but they can't afford the initial costs. There was nothing for them in this throne speech. Now, I listened very carefully to my first throne speech. I listened for words of concrete action to be taken, and I was hopeful hopeful that I would hear decisive action on the issues facing Canadians. I hoped I would hear a plan to restore confidence in pensions, which many seniors now feel are uncertain. There was no reassurance there, only promises on Senate reform and nuclear deregulation. I hoped to hear a real industrial strategy, because Nova Scotia manufacturing industries are hurting. We continue to lose workers to the West, and the reality is that under successive Liberal and Conservative governments, the Canadian economy has lost its innovative edge. Instead of grasping new opportunities, Canada is more reliant on the broken U.S. economy and more dependent on resource extraction. We are more than just the hewers of wood and the drawers of water. The NDP recognizes that diversity and productivity are the basis for an effective economic strategy. The NDP understands that the opportunities of the green economy must be grasped quickly, and most importantly, our party sees the security and confidence of people as the backbone to any economy. This must be our priority, and I did not hear the throne speech make these things the focus of our collective efforts here in the House of Commons, as I had hoped. Halifax is home to some of the premier research institutions in Canada who are waiting for a real strategy for innovation in the knowledge-based green economy of the future. These are the economic results that I want to see. These are the economic rights that Nova Scotians want to see. And these are the economic results that Canadians want to see. I had hoped to hear about creative new federal environmental policy to deal with catastrophic climate change. Listening to the throne speech, I was thinking about my riding with our wind and waves and tides, contrasted it to this government, which has decided that Canadian energy must come from nuclear or fossil fuels. In our province, we know that the consequence of remaining dependent on fossil fuels is ever-increasing energy costs. The consequence of this government's plan is to continue to see money taken out of our pockets and handed over to the fossil fuel executives while the benefits of the green economy pass us by. 
In Halifax, our transit system is busting at the seams. When new services have been added, people in Halifax have responded by using sustainable transportation. Now, some say that high gas prices will force people to take the bus, but in Sambro, a fishing community in my riding, Sambro doesn't even have a bus. And fishers in my riding deserve as much service as the rest of us. We need more buses and ferries and bike lanes, not more greenhouse gases, more radioactive uranium tailings, and more spent nuclear fuel warehoused who's, who knows where. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker, developed a quick consensus around the need for economic stimulus. We don't need to waste more money on failed solutions such as corporate tax cuts and nuclear plants. We need to create jobs throughout Canada. And in Halifax, I've seen how jobs can be created in an energy efficiency industry. These jobs can be created throughout the country, in every community. This is where we need to direct our efforts and our creativity, creating jobs by tackling the twin crises of international finance and climate change. Economists are calling for investment in infrastructure. In the throne speech, I hoped to hear about strong investments in public transit and affordable, efficient housing. Housing is infrastructure. Transit is infrastructure. Building both would create jobs, reduce greenhouse gases, and work towards poverty elimination. But Mr. Speaker, I did not hear the government seize upon these opportunities. I also hoped to hear recognition of arts and culture as part of our economy. Halifax has wonderful arts and culture communities who export film, music, theatre and dance, who create jobs in our city. And there was no mention of this vital aspect of our culture and our economy. I hoped for so much from the throne speech. I hoped to hear a commitment to act against violence against women by attacking the root causes of violence, or to hear about a national childcare program, or new post-secondary funding, or a commitment to international aid. I hoped to hear about a spectrum of supportive housing investments, or about a plan to strengthen education in First Nations communities, or for any indication that the government might finally abandon their continued march to reduce the taxes of their supporters and wealthy corporations, even when they admit that they will be running a budgetary deficit. I hoped, and I was disappointed. However, as New Democrats, we believe that we can bring hope and change not only to this House, but to Canadians who believe in well in the progress of nations. I have watched with genuine excitement as our friends in the United States elected a president who campaigned on hope and possibility. And I was struck by the fact that Canadians, we voted overwhelmingly by over 60% to reject the milquetoast conservative approach to the economic crisis when serious action is needed. Mr. Speaker, Canada needs bold action for the economy. We need a stimulus package that invests in the real economy of people. We need to protect people's jobs. We need to protect their savings, their homes, and pensions. And, while, and we need this government to deliver real results. While I was hopeful that a speech from the throne would signal a plan for this kind of action, it instead signaled to me that this government is content to continue on with the same legislative program that over 60% of Canadians opposed on October 14th. And this is why I must stand today and oppose the speech from the throne. The people of Halifax can count on my hard work and tireless efforts to ensure their voices heard in Parliament, and so can the millions of Canadians who voted New Democrat. I will end with a quote from the 1996 UNICEF Progress of Nations report. The day will come when the progress of nations will be judged not by their military or economic strength, nor by the splendor of their capital cities and public buildings, but by the well-being of their peoples, by their levels of health, nutrition, and education, by their opportunities to earn a fair reward for their labors, by their ability to participate in the decisions that affect their lives, by the respect that is shown for their civil and political liberties by the provision that is made for those who are vulnerable and disadvantaged, and by the protection that is afforded to the growing minds and bodies of their children. The people of Halifax expect and deserve no less, and I am honoured to represent and fight for their interests in this House. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Bravo. Yeah, yeah, bravo.